I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the history of mortgage lending. Uh, and then I want to talk more recently uh, about uh, how we do commercial real estate finance and then residential real estate finance. And then it, uh, I, if I have time, I'm going to try to get into um, discussing. I have to open the blackboard here. Uh, I have to. I've never done this. It's a massive <laughs> door. Uh, and someone was lecturing about astronomy. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, what, what we talk about real estate finance. It's really about financial contracts that involve real estate and that uh, particularly use real estate as collateral. Uh, so it's a very complicated history. But I, I like to put things in a long-term perspective. So uh, the word, I want to start with the word. Uh, that the word mortgage uh, It actually goes back to Latin, mortuus vadium. And that means, in Latin, Death pledge, okay, uh, and then in the Middle Ages in France, they substituted the French word for vadium, and that's I don't know how to pronounce it. That means pledge in French, or, and uh, I don't know why they call them death pledges. <laughs> that doesn't seem to involve death to me, but uh, it's in the long history of these institutions it became important. So uh, the Oxford English Dictionary says the word mortgage entered the English language in 1283. So we've got a long history here. Um, but uh, actually, I, I can take it back further than 1283. Uh, and I was inspired by the research of Yale historian Valerie Hansen, who has been uh, reading old uh, documents related to the silk trade. Uh, and her documents are based on a trove of old documents from the Tang Dynasty in China uh, between the 7th and 10th centuries, uh, which reflect loans that were made to finance trade. So you had people going back and forth from the Middle East to China with silk and other items, and they needed financing for the trade. So she reads these old documents in Chinese. Uh, and I was looking over her work a little bit to see whether they had mortgages. <laughs> uh, she, she says that in China, they didn't seem, to, at least if I'm getting her generalities right, they didn't seem to mortgage property, at least in these documents. But uh, she says that among these documents are some, they weren't all, all in Chinese because they were trading between China and many other countries. So she found some in this Sogdian language. <laughs> she reads all these languages. It's an ancient language of uh, what's modern day Iran. And the, uh, it's, a de it's a dead language. It died out in the ninth century. But uh, she finds some Sogdian documents that look like mortgages. So some people borrowed money for the silk trade, and they would mortgage their property. Or they're slaves. <laughs> you could mortgage slaves. It's an awful thought. Uh, and then the contracts would additionally say that you were obligated to maintain the property or the slaves. I guess that meant feed your slaves, <laughs> keep them healthy. Um, but those were mortgages uh, from the, uh, uh, well, over a thousand years ago. And so it's. Uh, it's a very old institution. Uh, but I think it, uh, it, it's formed its modern form more recently in, uh, 
it became a, a well-known term for the general public maybe in the late 18th century. Uh, I was trying to confirm that. I'm interested in history just <laughs> out of, uh, I don't know, just a passion for understanding origins of things. So I looked up mortgage uh, in uh, some uh, on ProQuest to find old. Uh, what were they talking about? And I found an article in the Hartford Current, uh, dated 1778. It actually wasn't an article; it was an ad that someone took out. Um, and I think it's kind of revealing of what the mortgage market looked like in 1778. So we here in Connecticut have. Did you know this? The oldest newspaper in America. Uh, that's the Hartford Current. So, uh, a man by the name of uh, Elisha Cornwell took out an ad in the Hartford Current uh, in 1778, um, and he explains in the ad that uh, he uh, um, lent money as a mortgage on, on somebody's farm. Uh, Actually, he sold his farm uh, and was asked, and instead of taking the money right up front, uh, he mortgaged the farm so that he sold it for 800 pounds and, uh, to another farmer, uh, and the farmer was promising to pay him, and if he didn't pay him, he should get back the farm. So the, the farmer subsequently sold the farm, or uh, did he mortgage it again? Or, uh, uh, he mortgaged the same farm for 880 pounds, <laughs> so he's made 80 pounds profit. It would all be fine and good, except he still hadn't paid back the first mortgage. Uh, and then the guy mortgaged it again uh, for 1,000 pounds, and Mr. Uh, Cornwell is protesting, hey, you didn't pay me for the farm in the first place, so you don't own the farm. How are you mortgaging it multiple times? Uh, so he said, I thought I better put an ad in the newspaper so that any subsequent victims of, the, uh, of this uh, farmer would be, uh, uh, would be warned. Uh, so that's the end of the ad, that he said, I, this is my farm, because <laughs> he didn't pay me. But this shows how undeveloped mortgage institutions were in 1778 because he had to put an ad in the newspaper to explain that. The problem was that nobody had any systematic way of, of representing title. Uh, the, uh, the farmer who bought it from, who, <laughs> who supposedly bought it from Mr. Cornwell really didn't, and nobody would know that. You know, he could fool people. So uh, I think that's partly why you didn't see so many mortgages in those days, because you couldn't, the law wasn't clear. The, the, the institutions uh, uh, were not clear about property. And so you couldn't really do a mortgage business if you couldn't find out whether the guy mortgaging the farm really owned it or not. And so uh, it wasn't until the late 19th century that uh, government started to get property law, or the rights to property uh, sufficiently advanced that we could develop a big national or international market in mortgages. So an important step is in Germany uh, in 1872, the, uh, or Prussia, uh, the uh, government created a Grundbuch law uh, that created a, uh, a system for Prussia that established in a book, a, a central book, who owns what exactly. That was in 1872. And in uh, 1897, they made it uh, a national German institution. Still, the United States did not have a Grundbuch at the time. It wasn't, it, uh, it developed uh, throughout the 20th century in different countries of the world that property rights would be clear enough that one could do a mortgage lending business. So that's why I think mortgage lending has really taken off in the 20th century. 
Um, Hernando de Soto, who's a, a Peruvian economist, uh, wrote a book a few years ago called Mystery of Capital, uh, and it's about the developing world. And he argued in that book that property rights, the problems that uh, we just heard about from the Hartford Current, are still very big and alive around the world today. That you can't easily establish who owns what in m many or most countries of the world. So, uh, that's a problem, and that's why we don't see mortgage finance uh, developing there. You can't make a loan. You know, if you go to some small town in some less developed country, you can ask around, who owns this property? And they'll tell you, you know, that, that's been in this such and such a family for a long time. But if you want solid knowledge of that, how do you, you know, if, you, if you're going to base a financial <coughs> transaction on it, you can't base it just on hearsay, right? I mean, someone else might have a different opinion. So, uh, even today, in many countries of the world, the laws are not developed well enough. We don't have property rights established well enough, and we have laws that might inhibit mortgages. For example, in many countries, if you give a mortgage on a property, uh, in other words, you lend on a property, uh, then, and the person doesn't pay, you're, you're supposed to be able to seize the property, right? But if the court system doesn't function well, or if it's kind of uh, left-leaning and, uh, and you know, supporting the rights of the person living in the home, you might not be able to get it, or it might take you ten years to get the guy thrown out of the house. Uh, now, it seems cruel to throw someone out of a house who doesn't pay on their mortgage. But you have to think of the other side of it. If we don't throw them out of the house, no one's going to make a mortgage. You have to be able to get the house, right? That's the idea of a mortgage. The guy doesn't pay, the lender gets the house. Uh, and so, uh, I think there's a general process of development, improving the uh, definition of property rights and improving the ability of lenders to get the property if it fails, uh, which is, accounts for the uh, advance of mortgage lending in the 20th and 21st century. So, that's my long history of mortgage lending. But I want to get into some specific instances. I said I would start with commercial real estate. And uh, my, uh, before, yeah. So, uh, and then I'll move to single family homes or residential uh, real estate. Uh, and I'm going to talk now mostly about the United States. Uh, this is too many countries to, to uh, think about. But, uh, what, see, one thing about finance is that it, it tends to develop a sort of tradition and a sort of standard contract. It's encouraged by laws and regulators. It's, you know, you, you kind of have to do the same sort of contract that other people are doing in your country. Uh, and the, 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 the st I think the standardization is it's kind of a limitation. We can't be creative in financing because the public and the regulators will not be receptive to new things. Uh, let me talk about some of the institutions uh, in finance in the United States. And it's, n it's natural to start with commercial real estate. So, uh, you see a lot of buildings around, okay? My question is, how are they owned? I don't know whether you think about this. Who owns these buildings? Um, well, in, in uh, much of the 20th century and still today, they tend to be owned as partnerships, real estate partnerships, which is different from a corporation. In a corporation, I, we talked about that yesterday, you might sell shares on the stock exchange if it's public, and it's defined as a legal person. Uh, and it has limited liability so that all the shareholders uh, don't have to worry about being sued as a result. But a partnership is different. And most real estate that's not part of a larger business is owned in a partnership rather than a corporation. And the reason is that they're taxed more favorably. Corporations have to pay a corporate profits tax. Okay, they're, they're double taxed. You, as an individual, pay an income tax, 
and your corporation pays a corporate income tax or corporate profits tax. Uh, so you're taxed twice. If, if, you, if you incorporate yourself or you, you set up some friends to do business in a corporation, you get taxed twice. So you don't like that. And obviously, you try to avoid that. The way to avoid it is not to have a partnership, not to have a corporation, but a partnership. Uh, and uh, you have to, it, 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 the law allows you to form partnerships to own a building, say. So you're, you're building, uh, like, I don't know how, 360 State Street. This is a new building that just went up in New Haven. Do you know this building? It's the biggest construction. Does anyone know who owns it? It's probably a partnership. I haven't investigated that. Or um, a, uh, um, or it's called a direct participation program. So the, uh, the partnership is an investment that is offered only to accredited investors. It's not generally available to the general public. And what is an accredited investor? The Securities and Exchange Commission takes it upon itself to define who are accredited investors that don't need the protections of the SEC. Basically, accredited investors are wealthy people. Uh, and it's defined in the SEC laws uh, who is accredited. Uh, you have to have at least a million dollars uh, or, or minimum income. And so if you are an accredited investor, you can invest in a DPP. All right? Uh, and th then the income of the property flows through to you as your personal income. It's not corporate income, so it's taxed only once. And you think about that. Well, why would anyone form a corporation? Because I don't want to be taxed twice, so uh, why don't we do all business as a DPP, as a partnership? The problem is that the government doesn't want you to do that. And so they have rules about what can form a partnership. And so uh, one of the uh, rules is that they have to have a limited life. So uh, a corporation goes on forever. And it derives a lot of its value from the fact that it lives forever. There's no end date. Uh, so we talked about that when I, when I brought up the first real corporation, the, the Dutch East India Company. The reason it got so valuable is people could see that this was growing as the first multinational. It was this huge company. It had all kinds of deals and alliances and business arrangements. And no one wanted that to end. The value came in the growth prospects for that. But a DPP has to end. So what you do is it, it's well de designed for a building. You buy the building and you depreciate it over the life of the contract. And then there's an end date, and at the end date, you sell the building to someone else. Uh, and then you close down the DPP. You don't hear about these partnerships as much. You hear about companies, corporations all the time. You don't hear about DPPs, first of all, because they don't get so big. They're typically one building, 360 state, for example, all right? And it only lasts for however, you know, 10, 20 years, and then it's gone. Uh, it might have a different name. So you, it doesn't. And it doesn't get advertised to the public because it's not available to the public. They can't go around trying to bring you in as an investor because they have to verify that you're an accredited investor. So it tends to be a project for wealthy people. Now, I mentioned that corporations have limited liability. Uh, partnerships uh, do not, in general. But in a, they, they, you can have a partner that involves two classes of partners. There's general partner that runs the business and does not have limited liability. In other words, if the business goes bad and loses money, the general partner can get sued. But there are other partners called limited partners, and they have to be passive investors, and they have limited liability. So what often happens is a, a DPP is created by someone who understands and knows real estate. Let's get 360 State Street built. 
Uh, you're going to know that eventually because once they open, they're going to open a supermarket in the first floor of 360 State. And I'll bet some of you will be over there um, because it'll be the closest supermarket to Yale University. Um, but it's all part of somebody's plan. There was some general partner who thought up this structure and got uh, limited partners in and uh, uh, is, uh, is running the uh, managing the building or hires a manager for the building and has a plan and a closeout plan. The building won't disappear, but they'll sell it to someone else. I really don't know th uh, the financing structure of 360 State, but I'm just pointing out this pl it's likely what's happened there. So that has been uh, the modern structure of real estate. And if they mortgage the building, it would be a, uh, the uh, DPP would mortgage the building uh, on behalf of the partners. Um, so, uh, so real estate, uh, uh, real estate uh, finance uh, in the United States. I'm, I might as well write it down. Just a, a DPP is a direct participation. Program and it, uh, it's direct in the sense that you, as an investor, are participating directly in the profits of it. You are a partner. You're not a shareholder. Okay. The, uh, the DPPs became criticized in the uh, 20th century because small investors couldn't access these. Uh, small investors were confined because they weren't accredited, they weren't big enough or important enough. They were not allowed to invest in these. It was supposed to be to protect them, all right, I guess. But uh, how does it protect them to subject them to double taxation? So there became, uh, it became a cause that why in the United States do we have most of our investors closed out of these lucrative investment opportunities? Why can't Individuals, basically, individuals couldn't invest in commercial real estate. And people said, well, people are supposed to diversify, they're supposed to hold different kinds of investments. Uh, so, what, what's the, uh, wh why would this be limited to them? So, Congress in the United States in 1960 created something new called a real. <laughs> I think the chalk is weak. <laughs> we, it's, I'm trying to be gentle, <laughs> and the chalk can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm not being rough, am I? <laughs> it keeps collapsing. I'll be very gentle here. <laughs> Real estate investment trusts are, it's abbreviated REITs. They, these were created in 1960 by an act of the U.S. Congress, and it was a democratization, another example of the democratization of finance. And I believe it started here in the United States. Now they are being copied all over the world. Uh, they got off to kind of a slow start after 1960, but they have grown uh, dramatically. And so, um, uh, the idea is that we will allow a company to, uh, well, it would be a trust, to create investments for the general public, for small investors, and they won't be double taxed either. Okay? So uh, a real estate investment trust has to follow the law, and then it can invest in buildings. And so maybe 360 State is owned by a REIT. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, they are not subject to the corporate profits tax. Now, wh once again, once, co once Congress creates a vehicle that's not taxed, er everyone's going to ask, well, I want my company to be a REIT, okay? So they had to define it so that it isn't generally available. It has it's limited to real estate. So the law says, 75% of the assets of the company have to be in real estate or cash. 
75% of the income has to be from real estate. 90% uh, of their income must be from real estate, dividend, interest, and capital gains. 95, this is all I think in your textbook, uh, Fabozzi. 95% of the income must be paid out. Um, and there has to be a long-term holder. No more than 30% of the income uh, can be from the sale of properties held less than four years. They don't want, you know, real estate churning uh, companies. So if you define all of that, you've got a REIT. Uh, and so that invention, which goes back to 1960, it's one of those things in finance. It, it starts out slowly. M most people don't hear of it. Uh, and then it starts to grow. And REITs, uh, and, and now they're everywhere around the world. Um, well, maybe not everywhere, but in many countries we have REITs. Uh, the U.S. REITs grew in a succession of booms. The first boom was in the late 1960s, uh, when the interest rates uh, in the United States rose above deposit ceilings. There used to be ceilings that the government imposed on savings banks' uh, deposit rates. And so suddenly the REITs were paying better than the savings banks and the public flocked to them. There was a second boom after the tax reform of 1986 eliminated some tax advantages of DPPs and partnerships. It used to be that the government allowed generous depreciation allowances for partnerships. And people would invest in buildings just as tax dodges. Because if, if you're allowed to depreciate the building very effectively, you can, you can kind of cook your profit so that it's not taxable. And so people were, were, were investing in buildings too much. The government created a distortion uh, that encouraged too much investment in DPPs. Uh, so in 1986, the government made it harder for, um, it, it eliminated a lot of the advantages of partnerships. And that caused the second REIT boom. Uh, and then, it, it, starting in the 1990s, with the real estate boom, uh, that the excitement the public got, that suddenly lots of new kinds of REITs appeared, and REITs that involve specialized properties and the like. Uh, now they're big, uh, and everyone talks about them. Uh, but it's interesting to me that it took 50 years to get as big as they are now. Uh, and again, the theme that I'm referring re Recurring here, the recurring theme, a couple of them. Uh, one is that the finance industry finds it difficult to innovate, and innovations take many years to happen. And secondly, that uh, the, there's a trend toward the democratization of finance. That if you go back in history, you'll find these same mortgages and partnerships and the like, but they were limited to a small number of wealthy people. And we're moving with the invention of REITs, for example, more and more people are getting involved. Okay. So that's commercial real estate. I wanted to talk now about uh, residential real estate, which is actually bigger. There are more houses than there are office buildings in this country, uh, or there's more value in housing. So this is bigger. Uh, in the United States, about two-thirds of households own their own home. Uh, it varies across countries, but there are many other countries with similarly high home ownership rates. And this home ownership is a product of government policy that encourages mortgage lending. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the history uh, of mortgage lending and the history of problems in mortgage lending. Now, I already took you back to the silk trade in the Tang Dynasty, but I'm going to be less so far back now. We're going to talk about uh, the United States and uh, the Great Depression. So the Great Depression in the United States uh, in the 1930s, after the 1929 stock market crash, was faced with a severe housing crisis. Home prices were falling, and people were defaulting on their mortgages in great numbers. Uh, in fact, the government had to create what they called a homeowner's loan corporation to bail people out. And they ended up bailing out 20% of American homeowners. It was a terrible crisis. So what was happening? I, I'm pointing this out because it's important in the history of uh, real estate. 
finance. Before the Great Depression, mortgages were growing, but uh, I'll say before the Great Depression, they tended to be two to five years, and they were balloon payments. What do I mean by that? When you bought a house in 1920, you'd go to a bank, and they would give you a loan for two to five years. So if you bought a house for $10,000, they would typically lend you half the money. They would lend you $5,000, and the loan would say, you pay interest every month until two years has ended, and then you re repay the $5,000. Okay. Um, and then you, if you, you could try to get another mortgage. You come back to us, and we'll do it again if we feel like it. Okay, that was the deal. Banks offered that, and it was becoming increasingly common. Pay. When we say a balloon payment, what we mean is it's really big. Balloons are big, all right? So you, you're paying monthly interest, but then in two years, you've got to come up with the whole $5,000, all right? But, okay, people thought, it's all right. I'll just go back to the bank, or maybe I go to another bank. So, you know, I go wherever I want, and I can borrow $5,000, okay? So this was, this was the way things were done. But what happened in the Great Depression? Two things happened. The unemployment rate went up to 25%. A. B. Home prices fell, in many cases, by more than a half. So if you borrowed $5,000 against a $10,000 home, your home might be worth only $4,000 now. So what do you do now? You go to a bank, okay? Two years is up. I got to refinance my mortgage. I go back to the bank, and I, go, and I show up, and I say, A, I'm unemployed, and my house is worth $4,000. The bank says, you know, no dice. You're not going to get renewed. So what happens? You've, you're forced to dump your house on the market. You declare bankruptcy. You, you've lost everything. You've lost your your $5,000 down payment. If you buy a $10,000 house and you borrow $5,000, then your, the other side is called your down payment. So that's what happened. It was happening to millions of Americans. And uh, so the Roosevelt administration decided that the old kind of mortgage didn't, what, there was something wrong with that mortgage. So in 1934, when uh, Franklin, well, it was a year after Franklin Roosevelt became president. They set up the Federal Housing Administration. Administration. And uh, it specified that, uh, well, it offered, it, it was trying to get lenders back in to lend to homeowners because it was a catastrophe in the country. I'm not saying writing this right. So in order to get lenders back in, the FHA started insuring mortgages. And that meant that if you're a mortgage lender and your mortgage, the, the person you lent the money to, doesn't repay you, and the house isn't worth enough, you, you can get the house, but you might lose money because the house has lost value, the government will make it up. So the government came in with what's called mortgage uh, insurance. Um, and at the same time, the government said all mortgages that are insured by the FHA must be 15 years or longer. And so the U.S. government imposed the long-term mortgage, mortgage on the mortgage industry. And they said this is better uh, because the mortgage uh, and secondly, it cannot be a balloon payment mortgage. The government said, you know, this is really imposing too much on ordinary people, that they have to come up with a huge sum of money at the end of the mortgage. So they required that the mortgages be 15-year amortizing. Um, such mortgages had been offered already by some banks in the United States in the 1920s. But it was innovative finance, and it, too complicated for most people. They didn't, it never caught on. Let me un understand, to amortize means to pay down the, the balance, okay? So in, uh, an amortizing mortgage has no balloon payment at the end. 
A 15-year amortizing mortgage has a fixed monthly payment. You make it every single month, and at the end, you're done. You, have a, you take your spouse out to dinner and you say, we've paid off our mortgage, we're done. So, there's no family crisis at the end. It's a fixed monthly payment. Now, the, the arithmetic of amortizing mortgages is a little confusing to some people, uh, and in 1934, it took some education. But I want to just describe the um, amortizing mortgage uh, system. Uh, all right, so we're going to have a mortgage of maturity, um, the maturity of the mortgage is in, is M, and that's in months, okay? So, uh, in 1934, they started out with 15-year mortgages, which they thought was pretty aggressive, but by the early 1950s, the FHA was emphasizing 30-year mortgages. That's a long time to pay off on your house. But the idea is, you know, your, your typical family, they, they get married and they're buying their first house, they're 25 years old, all right? So, let's give them a full 30 years to pay off the mortgage. They'll be 55, kids will be going off to college, <laughs> the, uh, they'll still be working. That's a comfortable length of time. Why not give them 30 years? Uh, and we guarantee the interest rate for 30 years. No surprises. You just know you have this monthly payment and you've got it. The question now is, how do we decide on the monthly payment? Okay. Uh, what the, with the idea of an amortizing mortgage is that you have a fixed payment every month, you have an interest rate, and you want to make sure that the, in, that the present value of the monthly payments equals the mortgage balance at the beginning. So, the initial mortgage balance, that's the amount you borrowed, has to equal the present discounted value of all the monthly payments. So, uh, what will I call the monthly payment? Let's call the monthly payment X is the monthly payment in dollars. Okay, so the mortgage balance is equal to X all over R over 12, where R is the annual interest rate, times 1 uh, uh, minus 1 all over um, 1 plus R over 12 to the nth power. That's just the annuity formula. Okay, so that's the formula that's used to compute. Let me make sure. I, um, so you, I've shown you that formula before. Um, um, it's the present value of a stream of payments equal to x. Um, did I write r over two? I meant r over twelve. So, what you have to do if you are calculating an amortizing mortgage, if the person is borrowing the amount, well, the amount mortgage balance, and I quote a rate R uh, per year, I have to plug that into the present value formula and find out what <laughs> monthly payment X makes the present value equal to the amount loaned. Now, that is a little bit of arithmetic that mortgage lenders would have had trouble doing. It's not that hard to do, right? But uh, uh, I have here a page from a mortgage table. From uh, I found this in the Yale Library. Uh, can you read that? Uh, that th this is from a 50-year-old book. This is before they had computers, uh, and so it was too hard to do this calculation. But I just wanted to. Can, uh, can you read it in back? Sort of. Uh, th this is for a 10-year mortgage. I just picked 10 years. That was uncommon. That's rather short. Some people would get shorter mortgages, especially older people. You know, if you're 60 years old, you don't want a 30 year mortgage. Um, you probably won't live that long. So they did give out shorter mortgages as well. So this is a page from a mortgage book uh, for 10 years, and this is for a 5% mortgage. 
So, it, and it shows the, uh, uh, the monthly payment for $1,000. If, if someone's borrowing $5,000, you'd multiply this by five, all right? But th they show it for around $1,000. Uh, and the monthly payment, it says monthly payment per $1,000 is $10.61. Uh, so what they've done is they've, they've found out X $10.61 is the X that makes this present value for R equal 5% equal to $1,000. They've done exactly this calculation. Now, they show the, um, the payment schedule, and the payment every month is $10.61. But what this table shows is the breakdown between amortization and interest. So, it shows the principal for each month. So, you borrow at the beginning, you borrow $1,000 on this mortgage, and you're paying $10.61 uh, per month, all right? Uh, so, each month, your balance goes down. This balance column, they subtract. Well, the question is, how do you figure it out? You're paying $10.61 per month, but part of that is interest. What part of that is interest? Well, it's 5% of, of uh, 5 percent divided by 12 of the $1,000 balance at the beginning. So, your initial interest is uh, $4.17. So, your principal is the $10.61 minus the interest. So, then that reduces your balance. The so, the initial interest is $4.17, the principal is $6.44. So, the balance is $993.56 after one month. The next month, they figure what fraction of your payment is interest by multiplying. 5% over 12 times the balance, $993.56. Uh, and then uh, that comes out to be $4.14 interest. You see, the interest is going to be going down because you're paying off the loan, but your payment is fixed. So the payment against principal is going up. So the first month was $4.17 interest, the next month is $4.14 interest. Offsetting that is the first month with $6.44 uh, cents being used to pay off your mortgage. The second month, it's more, $6.47. Okay? And this goes all the way down. I couldn't show the whole page here. Uh, but it, here, after six years, six months, your interest is down to $1.74 because your balance is down to $407.61. But, and, and so your payment of principal is much higher. So, the, the, the reason this table is important is that people move and they sell their house early. They don't hold it for the full 10 years. So, you have to figure out when someone sells his m house after six years, six months, what do they still owe? Well, they now owe, instead of $1,000, they owe $407.61. So, that's the idea of a long term mortgage. Your interest payments are changing all the time. Your principal payments are changing all the time, but your total payment is fixed. Uh, that was an invention, a financial innovation in uh, 1934. Uh, and it is now offered, this is called a conventional fixed rate mortgage, and it's now offered in many countries of the world. However, there's only two countries where it's the major kind of mortgage the United States. And Denmark. And this is a strange, strange thing. Uh, this invention has not caught on around the world. It's, it's unique to only two countries, although you can get it in other countries. Uh, it's not available in Canada in any number. I guess you could find it, you, 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 but uh, it's not common elsewhere. Uh, every time I go to a foreign country, I ask the people there why. Why uh, do you have? Uh, why don't you have fixed rate mortgages? Uh, and uh, I don't necessarily get good answers. I've been trying to understand why it hasn't caught on. Then I recently saw that uh, Alastair Darling, um, who is, uh, who was under the Labor government. Uh, uh, Chancellor. I'm trying to be gentle here. 
Alastair Darling was Chancellor of the Exchequer in the United Kingdom uh, until the conservative government took over. And he issued a statement saying that uh, UK should finally adopt the long term mortgage. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason, the problem is, is that uh, any country that doesn't have a long term fixed rate mortgage runs the risk of falling into the same problem that the United States did in the Great Depression. Some kind of crisis like that could mean that people would lose their homes in great numbers. Uh, so he said he'd like to see the UK get people borrowing at 10, 20, or even 25 years for their mortgages. But instead, what happened was the conservative government <laughs> took over. Uh, but there are, you can in the UK get long term mortgages. And I, I think it's true in most countries of the world. They're just not common there. And it's a bit of a puzzle. Why is it that only two countries do this generally? I, I have a couple of reasons uh, offered why it is. Uh, one of them is that the general public is resistant to long term mortgages because they charge a higher interest. If the government is going to guarantee a rate for 30 years, not the government, the bank, the lender is going to guarantee it for 30 years, they're going to have to charge you a higher rate because that guarantee costs something for them. And, and consumers are, are resistant to paying the higher rate. Uh, and that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that bank regulators <coughs> might not encourage banks to make these loans because it's risky for banks. If banks make, tie their money up for 30 years, and then they have depositors who can withdraw their money at any time, the banks could go under. If there was ever a run on the banks, they can't liquidate these mortgages fast at all. So you need a coordinated effort of a government to first make sure the regulators, um, the regulators uh, accept these concepts. and are, It puts some risk on the public of a possible bailout of the banking system. Uh, but, uh, uh, and then you have to get past public resistance. To the, you have to make the public understand that when you get a fixed rate mortgage, it's a, it's a clean contract. We have no worries for 30 years, uh, as opposed to there are problems that have sometimes occurred. In Canada in 1980, the, um, the government, uh, the, the um, interest rate shot way up, and we had a kind of a duplicate of the problem that we saw in the US. People couldn't afford to refinance their mortgages, and a lot of people lost their homes, uh, and so it was a, a big problem. But that they somehow got through that, and they're not really thinking about uh, fixed rate mortgages in Canada even now today. Uh, so uh, I wanted to go on talking about uh, the, uh, innovation in finance. Another very important innovation is. Uh, securitization of mortgages uh, and government support of mortgage markets. So, uh, in the United States, uh, in 1938, the federal government, this is also Roosevelt administration, set up the Federal National Mortgage. Administration, uh, which was a government agency that would uh, buy mortgages to support the mortgage market. Uh, the, on Wall Street, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't pronounce Federal National Mortgage, or is it Association? <laughs> I'm sorry, I have administration. Is it Association? It's Association, not Administration. Uh, the, uh, the, you know what they called it on Wall Street? They called it Fannie Mae. That was just an uh, irreverent shortened name for the uh, association. It was run by the government. Uh, and uh, however, it was in the year. Um, 1968, the U.S. government privatized Fannie Mae, uh, and it became a private corporation. 
So what did Fannie Mae do? It would buy mortgages from banks. They were trying to encourage the mortgage market. So a bank would lend money to someone to buy a house, uh, and then they're done. They can't lend any more money unless they raise more deposits. Well, Fannie Mae would buy the mortgage from them, and get, they'd have money again to lend again. Uh, and so they did this in 38 because we were still in the depression, and the housing, in the housing market was still depressed. They weren't building homes. There were lots of unemployed construction workers. And so Roosevelt was just thinking, how can we stimulate the economy? And this was their, one of their ideas. So Fannie Mae was the, uh, the mortgage finance giant that was created uh, in 1968. Uh, I can shut this off here. Uh, so uh, in uh, uh, 1970, government created another Fannie Mae-like institution uh, called. Fr and it, its official name was. Uh, Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, uh, and uh, Wall Street had to invent a name for it, so uh, they called it Freddie Mac. Okay, they thought, well, we gave a girl's name to Fannie Mae. <laughs> Let's give a boy's name. I guess that's a boy's name. Uh, now both of these organizations call them. Uh, bo they're they're both private companies now, but created by the government. Uh, they, they, they both use these names officially now, so that's their name now, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But Freddie Mac was initially different, because what the government asked Freddie Mac to do is buy mortgages and then repackage them as mortgage securities and sell them off with a guarantee, a Freddie Mac guarantee. Uh, and so once Freddie Mac started doing this, Fannie Mae said, well, can't we do that too? So they both do it. So what the, the go government had done is create two private corporations. You kind of wonder, well, uh, private corporations, wh why did the government even do that? Anyone can create. Remember, we have a corporate law. I can start my own Freddie Mac, okay, my own Fannie Mae. But the government <laughs> did create them, well, by privatizing Fannie Mae and by creating Freddie Mac. Uh, and they are both in the mortgage securitization business. So they would buy from mortgage originators, people who lend the money, they'd buy the mortgages. They, in other words, they'd take the IOU from someone, they'd repackage them into securities and sell them off uh, to the public with a guarantee from Fannie or Freddie that the mortgage, uh, if, if there were a default, the mortgage would extra balance would be made up by Fannie or Freddie. Okay. Well, they might then, they did then get other companies called mortgage insurers to insure at least part of the uh, balance. So it's a complicated financial agreement. But what we had was private companies created by the U.S. government that created securities for investors that were guaranteed against default and based on the, um, based on mortgages. Uh, so the, um, the government then also stated that these are private companies and the U.S. government does not stand behind them. People started to say, the government created these two corporations and now they're, they're securitizing and guaranteeing trillions of dollars of mortgages and is this going to come back and end up being paid for by the taxpayer? Uh, so the government stated clearly. These are now private corporations. Fannie Mae started out as part of the government, but no longer. Now it's a private corporation, and if Fannie Mae goes bankrupt, woe betide anyone who bought their securities, because their guarantee is not backed up by the federal government. So uh, people complained, though. They said, it's, you're, you're saying that it's not backed up by the federal government, but do you really mean that? If Fannie or Freddie goes bankrupt, Will the U.S. government just let them go under? Uh, well, the official statement was, yes, the government will let them go under. Guess what happened? <laughs> okay. uh, in 2008, the, mo the real estate market crashed, and we had our first housing crisis that was similar to the Great Depression. And in that housing crisis, uh, both Fannie and Freddie went bankrupt. 
okay? And now, what do we do? We're in the Bush administration, Republican. They don't particularly like bailouts, okay? Uh, so you'd think, of course, uh, George W. Bush would just, it's the law, right? The federal government's not going to bail them out. But then some people said, wait a minute. You know, all over the world, people are investing in these, <coughs> thinking that, well, Fannie Mae was created by the U.S. government. In particular, a lot of Chinese, those poor innocent Chinese, <laughs> were trusting the Americans, and they put many billions of dollars into Fannie Mae. Are you going to go and tell the Chinese, sorry, you know, we won't back it? Well, someone could say, sure, go tell them that. It's what we've been saying all along. But then the Chinese could come back and say, well, you've been saying that, but nobody believed you. Everyone knew that that wasn't right. And, 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 and you, the federal government didn't take all the right steps to make it really clear. For example, the Wall Street Journal used to list Fannie Mae bonds and Freddie Mac bonds in a section of the newspaper entitled Government Securities. <laughs> and, see, and that's the Wall Street Journal. That's not the government talking. But, you know, the U.S. government should have come in and told them, no, those are not government. So we poor, innocent Chinese investors, we, we read your paper and it said government securities. Uh, now, George Bush could have said, tough luck. You know, you guys, you should have read the fine print. But he didn't, all right? Why not? Because it jeopardizes too much. If the U.S. government lets these agencies that it created go bankrupt, and it lets all those people all over the world who invested in those securities, they're going to be mad, right? And, you know, we, just ha we have a reputation. The United States is able to raise so much money from all over the world because they think that it's safe here. And if we just let these fail, it's not going to look right. So the U.S. government took them both under conservatorship and is paying their debts, paying off. So those did not default. What we've learned from this lesson is that you can say a million times that you're not going to guarantee something, but when it comes, eventually, you end up guaranteeing it. Um, I wanted to just say something about other countries a little bit. Uh, Canada has something like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, called the Canada Housing and Mortgage Corporation. Uh, and uh, so I'll just talk about other uh, countries. The Canada Housing and Mortgage Corporation. Uh, and it was created in, um, I actually don't have the year, but it was created by the government of Canada, and it does work that resembles FHA, and it resembles Fannie Mae, but it's owned by the Canadian government. It's not privatized. Um, and so you, you, you might say, well, it's the same in Canada, but the big difference is it's smaller. They didn't let it get as big as Fannie and Freddie, and so uh, it isn't heard as much from. I, I was a keynote speaker at a conference uh, February 3 uh, that the Financial Times organized in New York called Focus on Canada. Uh, and I had to give a talk about Canada to New York investors. They told me there were hardly any Canadians in the audience. So what are we doing here in New York talking about Canada? <laughs> well, it's because the Americans invest heavily in Canada. So I was up talking to all these American people, and I, I was looking at Canada and Canada banking system, and the, I said to the group, you know, Canada and America are just so similar, I can't see much of a difference. And that the, uh, the, the recent financial, Canada had, didn't have Fannie and Freddie, it didn't have these housing problems, but the, the worldwide recession hit Canada pretty hard. Um, and so I said, uh, Canada and U.S. are kind of like two peas in a pod. That's what I said. <laughs> They're so similar. Uh, people like to make much of differences, but the Canadian economies just move up and down in lockstep. Um, and I also said Canada was saved by the oil crisis, uh, being an oil exporter. And if it didn't have the oil... In 2008, remember when the oil prices shot up? But little to my knowledge, there was a reporter for the Financial Post in Canada in the audience. <laughs> And my talk got 
reported in the Financial Post. Um, and then um, I went on their website, and there's blogs, angry blogs from Canadians. <laughs> Uh, I don't think it's so insulting to Canada to say that we're just basically similar. I didn't, uh, but, uh, 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 but I, what I'm, uh, and yeah, I'll have to say this for Canada. They did not get so gung ho on supporting mortgages as the United States did. So they didn't have such a big housing bubble that the U.S. did. Uh, part of the reason the U.S. had a housing bubble as big as it did is that the U.S. government, See, these guys really weren't independent. They were taking orders from the government, and the government was telling them to increase their lending to low income or to underserved communities. They, wanted, they were promoting the bubble, and so Fannie and Freddie were told to promote lending to houses during the real estate bubble that preceded the crisis. That didn't happen, at least not so much in Canada, so they've had less of a bubble. Uh, but still, the uh, two countries are, are, are basically very similar. Uh, so, uh, I think we're, the, the textbook talks a lot about mortgage securities. And um, there's a uh, major category, I, I expect you to read this out of Fabozzi. Uh, I actually got complaints. Uh, I, I'll tell you, in past years, students found this the least enjoyable part of the readings for this course. But uh, you should know about these things. So, th th we have securities called collateralized mortgage obligations. Uh, th these are uh, mortgage securities that hold, th they're securities that are sold off to investors, and they, they, they hold mortgages. But the, uh, as is explained in Fabozzi, they will divide them into sep separate uh, tranches or separate. Um, uh, securities in terms of prepayment risk. Uh, that is, th there's a risk that the mortgages will be paid off early in times when it's adverse to the investor interest. So they would divide up the risks into different classes of securities. And some of them were rated AAA by the rating agencies because they thought there was almost no risk to those securities. Uh, and others were rated uh, different, differently. And these, were, these CMOs were, were uh, sold to investors all over the world. Uh, another kind of security which the textbook talks about is a CDO, which is a collateralized debt obligation. And these are issued to investors, and they typically hold mortgage securities as their assets. Uh, many of them held subprime mortgages in recent years, mortgages that were uh, issued against subprime borrowers. Uh, and uh, um, a lot of these securities that were rated very highly by the rating agencies, rated triple A, uh, ended up defaulting and losing money for their investors. And the investors were all over the world. The United States is a leader in mortgage finance. And it was issuing companies in the United States uh, were issuing, not just Fannie and Freddie, but lots of companies were issuing mortgage securities that had triple A ratings, which meant that Moody's and Standard and Poor's and the other rating agencies were telling you basically there was no risk to them. And so people in Europe, in Asia, were investing in these, and they thought they were perfectly safe, and then they went under. Um, and Part of it was bad faith dealings by some of the issuers. Some of the issuers themselves doubted that these mortgages were so safe. Uh, but what do I care? I, uh, this is what happened. Somebody originated, it's gotten to, be, uh, to a complicated set of steps. Uh, it, it, somebody originates the mortgage. Okay, that means I talk to the homeowner, I have the homeowner fill out the papers. Then after they've originated the mortgage, they sell it to an investor, okay, like Fannie or Freddie or some private mortgage securitizer. Um, and the private mortgage securitizer finds a mortgage servicer, it may be the originator, who will then service the mortgage. And what does it mean to service the mortgage? It means to call you on the phone if you missed your payment, for example. Or if you have questions about the mortgage, there should be someone you call. 
So the mortgage servicer does that. So that's a separate entity. And then we have the CMO uh, organizer, the originator. And then we have the CDO originator. It's gotten to be a very complicated financial system. And then the whole thing collapsed. So there's been a, a lot of reform to try to uh, see what can we do to prevent this kind of collapse. Some people would say, let's end the whole thing. Let's go back to 1778. Let's not have mortgage securitizers. But that's not the steps that have been taken. Uh, and I think that uh, we are making progress. And I want to just conclude with just a little reference to one important change that was made in both Europe and the United States. So uh, the European Parliament uh, <coughs> passed a new directive that requires or uh, incentivizes mortgage originators to keep 5% uh, of the mortgage balance in their own portfolio. So that means if you originate a portfolio, you can sell off, if you originate mortgages, you can sell off 95% of the mortgages to investors, but you have to keep 5%. So this 5% limit was then later incorporated into the Dodd-Frank Act in the United States. So we again have the same requirement. And this is supposed to reduce the moral hazard problem that created the crisis and retain the mortgage securitization uh, process. So the, the idea is this. You, you, and I know I heard people tell me, mortgage originators sometimes got cynical. They thought, OK, I'm helping this family fill out a mortgage. What do I care? <laughs> you know, I think this, this family doesn't look they're, they're not going to pay this back. <laughs> Is it something? Uh, but what do I care? I, I'll, I'll fill it out, I'll sell the mortgage to someone else, and I'm out of here. Uh, in fact, it got bad in some cases. Some mortgage brokers, a family would come in offering to, wanting to buy a house, and the mortgage broker would say that, well, what is your income anyway? Uh, and uh, they would tell him the income, and he would say, well, you're, you're trying to buy a $300,000 house on that income? I said, I don't know if I can do this. But then he would say, uh, wait a minute, think about this again. Is that really your income? Uh, you told me your income is uh, 40000 a year. Are you sure? Or don't you have some other, why don't we say 50000 a year? <laughs> or I'll say 60000 a year. And the couple would look at him in disbelief and say, no, we, don't ha we only have 40000 And he said, well, think about it. You have other sources, don't you? And, they, and, the, and, and he said, you know, everybody does this, you know? So, okay, we have 60000 He says, fine. And he, and he, um, and they thought, well, the mortgage broker gave me permission to do this. Uh, and he doesn't care because he's not going to take the loss. So the new law is supposed to discourage that kind of thing. And there's lots of new laws that are trying to tighten up. For example, mortgage brokers in the United States now have to be licensed. It used to be, just five years ago, you could be an ex-con, fresh out of jail, and you could take up a business as mortgage broker. You can't anymore. So what's happening all over the world is that we've learned from this experience, but we're retaining this basic system of mortgage securitization. Mortgage lenders that are professional. The, the basic industry has been retained, and we're hoping and thinking that maybe we have a better system. So I will stop there, and I'll see you uh, on Monday.